Aesthetics is a branch of philosophy dealing with the nature of art, beauty, and taste, with the creation and appreciation of beauty. It is more scientifically defined as the study of sensory or sensory emotional values, sometimes called judgments of sentiment and taste. More broadly, scholars in the field define aesthetics as critical reflection on art, culture and nature, in modern English. The term aesthetic can also refer to a set of principles underlying the works of a particular art movement or theory. One speaks for example of the cubist aesthetic. Etymology. The word aesthetic is derived from the Greek alpha sigma theta eta tau iota kappa rho micron sigma, which in turn was derived from alpha sigma theta alpha nu o micron mu alpha iota. The term aesthetics was appropriated and coined with new meaning in the German form aesthetic by Alexander Baumgarten for the first time in his Dissertation Mediationis Philosophicid in On Alisad Poema Pertinenti Bis in 1735. Even though his later definition in the fragment Aesthetica is more often referred to as the first definition of modern aesthetics, aesthetics and the philosophy of art. Aesthetics is for the artist as ornithology is for the birds. Barnett Newman For some, aesthetics is considered a synonym for the philosophy of art since Hegel, while others insist that there is a significant distinction between these closely related fields. In practice, aesthetic judgment refers to the sensory contemplation or appreciation of an object, while artistic judgment refers to the recognition, appreciation or criticism of art or an artwork. Philosophical aesthetics has not only to speak about art and to produce judgments about artworks, but has also to give a definition of what art is. Art is an autonomous entity for philosophy, because art deals with the senses and art is as such free of any moral or political purpose. Hence, there are two different conceptions of art in aesthetics. Art as knowledge or art as action, but aesthetics is neither epistemology nor ethics. History before the 20th century. See also, beauty any aesthetic doctrines that guided the production and interpretation of prehistoric art are mostly unknown. An indirect concern with aesthetics can be inferred from ancient art in many early civilizations, including Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia, Greece, China, the Etruscans, Rome, India, the Celtic peoples, and the Maya, as each of them developed a unique and characteristic style in its art. Western aesthetics usually refers to Greek philosophers as the earliest source of formal aesthetic considerations. Plato believed in beauty as a form in which beautiful objects partake and which causes them to be beautiful. He felt that beautiful objects incorporated proportion, harmony, and unity among their parts. Similarly, in the metaphysics, Aristotle found that the universal elements of beauty were order, symmetry, and definiteness. From the late 17th to the early 20th century Western aesthetics underwent a slow revolution into what is often called modernism. German and British thinkers emphasized beauty as the key component of art and of the aesthetic experience and saw art as necessarily aiming at absolute beauty. For Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten aesthetics is the science of the sense experiences, a younger sister of logic, and beauty is thus the most perfect kind of knowledge that sense experience can have. For Immanuel Kant the aesthetic experience of beauty is a judgment of a subjective but similar human truth. Since all people should agree that this rose is beautiful, if it in fact is, However, beauty cannot be reduced to any more basic set of features. For Friedrich Schiller aesthetic appreciation of beauty is the most perfect reconciliation of the sensual and rational parts of human nature. For Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schelling, the philosophy of art is the organon of philosophy concerning the relation between man and nature. So aesthetics began now to be the name for the philosophy of art. Friedrich von Schlegel, August Wilhelm Schlegel, Friedrich Schleiermacher and Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel also gave lectures on aesthetics as philosophy of art after 1800. For Hegel, all culture is a matter of absolute spirit, coming to be manifest to itself, stage by stage.
changing to a perfection that only philosophy can approach. Art is the first stage in which the absolute spirit is manifest immediately to sense perception, and is thus an objective rather than subjective revelation of beauty. For Arthur Schopenhauer aesthetic contemplation of beauty is the most free that the pure intellect can be from the dictates of will, here we contemplate perfection of form without any kind of worldly agenda, and thus any intrusion of utility or politics would ruin the point of the beauty. It is thus for Schopenhauer one way to fight the suffering. The British were largely divided into intuitionist and analytic camps. The intuitionists believed that aesthetic experience was disclosed by a single mental faculty of some kind. For Anthony Ashley Cooper, 3rd Earl of Shaftesbury this was identical to the moral sense, beauty just as the sensory version of moral goodness. For Ludwig Wittgenstein aesthetics consisted in the description of a whole culture which is a linguistic impossibility. Hence his viewpoint can be paraphrased as, that which constitutes aesthetics lies outside the realm of the language game. For Oscar Wilde, the contemplation of beauty for beauty's sake was more than the foundation for much of his literary career. He once stated, Aestheticism is a search after the signs of the beautiful. It is the science of the beautiful through which men seek the correlation of the arts. It is, to speak more exactly, the search after the secret of life. Wilde famously toured the United States in 1882. He traveled across the United States spreading the idea of aesthetics in a speech called the English Renaissance. In his speech he proposed that, beauty in aesthetics was not languid but energetic. By beautifying the outward aspects of life, one would beautify the inner ones. The English Renaissance was, he said, like the Italian Renaissance before it, a sort of rebirth of the spirit of man. For Francis Hutcheson beauty is disclosed by an inner mental sense, but as a subjective fact rather than an objective one. Analytic theorists like Henry Home, Lord Kames, William Hogarth, and Edmund Burke hope to reduce beauty to some list of attributes. Hogarth, for example, thinks that beauty consists of fitness of the parts to some design, variety in as many ways as possible, uniformity, regularity or symmetry, which is only beautiful when it helps to preserve the character of fitness, simplicity or distinctness which gives pleasure not in itself but through its enabling the eye to enjoy variety with ease, intricacy, which provides employment for our active energies, leading the eye on a wanton kind of chase, and quantity or magnitude, which draws our attention and produces admiration and awe. Later analytic aestheticians strove to link beauty to some scientific theory of psychology or biology, new criticism and the intentional fallacy. During the first half of the 20th century, a significant shift to general aesthetic theory took place which attempted to apply aesthetic theory between various forms of art, including the literary arts and the visual arts, to each other. This resulted in the rise of the new criticism school and debate concerning the intentional fallacy. At issue was the question of whether the aesthetic intentions of the artist in creating the work of art, whatever its specific form, should be associated with the criticism and evaluation of the final products of the work of art, or, if the work of art should be evaluated on its own merits independent of the intentions of the artist. In 1946, William K. Wimsatt and Monroe Beardsley published a classic and controversial new critical essay entitled The Intentional Fallacy, in which they argued strongly against the relevance of an author's intention or intended meaning in the analysis of a literary work. For Wimsatt and Beardsley, the words on the page were all that mattered. Importation of meanings from outside the text was considered irrelevant and potentially distracting. In another essay, The Effective Fallacy, which served as a kind of sister essay to The Intentional Fallacy, Wimsatt and Beardsley also discounted the reader's personal, emotional reaction to a literary work as a valid means of analyzing a text. This fallacy would later be repudiated by theorists from the Reader Response School of Literary Theory. Ironically, one of the leading theorists from this school, Stanley Fish was himself trained by new critics. 
Fish criticizes Wimsat and Beardsley in his essay, Literature in the Reader, as summarized by Gout and Livingston in their essay, The Creation of Art. Structuralist and post-structuralist theorists and critics were sharply critical of many aspects of new criticism, beginning with the emphasis on aesthetic appreciation and the so-called autonomy of art. But they reiterated the attack on biographical criticism's assumption that the artist's activities and experience were a privileged critical topic. These authors contend that anti-intentionalists, such as formalists, hold that the intentions involved in the making of art are irrelevant or peripheral to correctly interpreting art. So details of the act of creating a work, though possibly of interest in themselves, have no bearing on the correct interpretation of the work. Gout and Livingston define the intentionalists as distinct from formalists stating that intentionalists, unlike formalists, Hold that reference to intentions is essential in fixing the correct interpretation of works. They quote Richard Walheimer stating that the task of criticism is the reconstruction of the creative process, where the creative process must in turn be thought of as something not stopping short of but terminating on the work of art itself. Postmodern aesthetics and psychoanalysis Early 20th century artists, poets and composers challenge existing notions of beauty, broadening the scope of art and aesthetics. In 1941, Eli Siegel, American philosopher and poet, founded Aesthetic Realism, the philosophy that reality itself is aesthetic, and that the world, art, and self explain each other. Each is the aesthetic oneness of opposites. Various attempts have been made to define postmodern aesthetics. The challenge to the assumption that beauty was central to art and aesthetics, thought to be original, is actually continuous with older aesthetic theory. Aristotle was the first in the Western tradition to classify beauty into types as in his theory of drama, and Kant made a distinction between beauty and the sublime. What was new was a refusal to credit the higher status of certain types where the taxonomy implied a preference for tragedy and the sublime to comedy and the rococo. Croce suggested that expression is central in the way that beauty was once thought to be central. George Dickey suggested that the sociological institutions of the art world were the glue binding art and sensibility into unities. Marshall McLuhan suggested that art always functions as a counter-environment, designed to make visible what is usually invisible about a society. Theodore Adorno felt that aesthetics could not proceed without confronting the role of the culture industry in the commodification of art and aesthetic experience. Hal Foster attempted to portray the reaction against beauty and modernist art in the anti-aesthetic essays on postmodern culture. Arthur Danter has described this reaction as calophobia. Andre Malro explains that the notion of beauty was connected to a particular conception of art that arose with the Renaissance and was still dominant in the 18th century. The discipline of aesthetics, which originated in the 18th century, mistook this transient state of affairs for a revelation of the permanent nature of art. Brian Masumi suggests to reconsider beauty following the aesthetical thought in the philosophy of Deleuze and Guattari. Jean-Francois Lyotard re-invokes the Kantian distinction between taste and the sublime. Sublime painting, unlike kitsch realism, will enable us to see only by making it impossible to see. It will please only by causing pain. Sigmund Freud inaugurated aesthetical thinking in psychoanalysis mainly via the uncanny as aesthetical effect. Following Freud and Merleau-Ponty, Jacques Lacan theorized aesthetics in terms of sublimation and the thing. The relation of Marxist aesthetics to postmodern aesthetics is still her contentious area of debate. Recent Aesthetics Guy Cerchello has pioneered efforts in analytic philosophy to develop a rigorous theory of aesthetics, focusing on the concepts of beauty, love and sublimity. In contrast to romantic theorists, Cerchello argued for the objectivity of beauty and formulated a theory of love on that basis. British philosopher and theorist of conceptual art aesthetics, Peter Osborne, 
makes the point that post-conceptual art aesthetic does not concern a particular type of contemporary art so much as the historical ontological condition for the production of contemporary art in general. Osborne noted that contemporary art is post-conceptual in a public lecture delivered in 2010. Gary Tedman has put forward a theory of a subjectless aesthetics derived from Karl Marx's concept of alienation, and Louis Althusser's anti-humanism, using elements of Freud's group psychology, defining a concept of the aesthetic level of practice. Gregory Lowen has suggested that the subject is key in the interaction with the aesthetic object. The work of art serves as a vehicle for the projection of the individual's identity into the world of objects, as well as being the eruptive source of much of what is uncanny in modern life. As well, art is used to memorialize individuated biographies in a manner that allows persons to imagine that they are part of something greater than themselves. Aesthetics and Science the field of experimental aesthetics was founded by Gustav Theodor Fechner in the 19th century. Experimental aesthetics is characterized by a subject-based inductive approach. The analysis of individual experience and behavior based on experimental methods is a central part of experimental aesthetics. In particular, the perception of works of art, music, or modern items such as websites or other IT products is studied. Experimental aesthetics is strongly oriented towards the natural sciences. Modern approaches mostly come from the fields of cognitive psychology or neuroscience. In the 1970s, Abraham Moles and Frieda Naik were among the first to analyze links between aesthetics, information processing, and information theory. In the 1990s, Jürgen Schmidhuber described an algorithmic theory of beauty which takes the subjectivity of the observer into account in postulates. Among several observations classified as comparable by a given subjective observer, the aesthetically most pleasing one is the one with the shortest description. Given the observer's previous knowledge in his particular method for encoding the data, this is closely related to the principles of algorithmic information theory and minimum description length. One of his examples, mathematicians enjoy simple proofs with a short description in their formal language. Another very concrete example describes an aesthetically pleasing human face whose proportions can be described by very few bits of information. Drawing inspiration from less detailed 15th-century proportion studies by Leonardo da Vinci and Albrecht Dürer, Schmidhuber's theory explicitly distinguishes between what's beautiful and what's interesting, stating that interestingness corresponds to the first derivative of subjectively perceived beauty. Here the premise is that any observer continually tries to improve the predictability and compressibility of the observations by discovering regularities such as repetitions and symmetries and fractal self-similarity. Whenever the observer's learning process leads to improved data compression such that the observation sequence can be described by fewer bits than before, the temporary interestingness of the data corresponds to the number of saved bits. This compression progress is proportional to the observer's internal reward, also called curiosity reward. A reinforcement learning algorithm is used to maximize future expected reward by learning to execute action sequences that cause additional interesting input data with yet unknown but learnable predictability or regularity. The principles can be implemented on artificial agents which then exhibit a form of artificial curiosity. Truth is beauty, mathematics, mathematical considerations, such as symmetry and complexity, are used for analysis in theoretical aesthetics. This is different from the aesthetic considerations of applied aesthetics used in the study of mathematical beauty. Aesthetic considerations such as symmetry and simplicity are used in areas of philosophy, such as ethics and theoretical physics and cosmology to define truth outside of empirical considerations. Beauty and truth have been argued to be nearly synonymous, as reflected in the statement, beauty is truth. 
Truth Beauty, in the poem Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats, or by the Hindu motto, Satyam Shivam Sundaram, is Shiva, and Shiva is Sundaram. The fact that judgments of beauty and judgments of truth both are influenced by processing fluency, which is the ease with which information can be processed, has been presented as an explanation for why beauty is sometimes equated with truth. Indeed, recent research found that people use beauty as an indication for truth in mathematical pattern tasks. However, scientists including the mathematician David Orell and physicist Marcelo Gleiser have argued that the emphasis on aesthetic criteria such as symmetry is equally capable of leading scientists astray. Computational inference of aesthetics since about 2005, computer scientists have attempted to develop automated methods to infer aesthetic quality of images. Typically, these approaches follow a machine learning approach, where large numbers of manually rated photographs are used to teach a computer about what visual properties are of relevance to aesthetic quality. The Equine Engine, developed at Penn State University, rates natural photographs uploaded by users. Notable in this area is Michael Layton, professor of psychology at Rutgers University. Layton is the president of the International Society for Mathematical and Computational Aesthetics and the International Society for Group Theory in Cognitive Science and has developed a generative theory of shape. There have also been relatively successful attempts with regard to chess and music. A relation between Max Benzer's mathematical formulation of aesthetics in terms of redundancy and complexity and theories of musical anticipation was offered using the notion of information rate.